Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study here on Judges 6, 7, and 8, the story of Gideon. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this morning, uh, for the time that we have each morning to open your word together. We're thankful for the things that we have been studying and how you have enlightened our minds. And uh, we can see the relevance for us today in these stories of the past. We ask, Lord, that you can continue to speak to our hearts, that you can bring this conviction and power in our lives, and that we can be an influence for good in this world. We pray for each of those studying these truths, watching these videos. We know the struggles that many face each day just for survival in this world of sin and suffering. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit can be with them, that your angels can watch over them, and that you can bless them. Help us to minister to those around us. Even though we may have little, help us to be a blessing. Be with us now as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so yesterday we, we spent a bit of time, almost to some ways, uh, diverting a little bit, it could seem, to people looking at these studies and, and going back to some of the things that we talked about. Now, um, what, I've, what I've been trying to do and what we've been trying to do is take Judges 6, 7, and 8 and see if we can fit them into this line of the 777 structure um, from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. And then we extended that to this fourth angel. And um, uh, so, and part of that was we, we looked into uh, this orb and Zeb, an orb being a raven. And Z being a wolf, and a raven comes from the idea of evening, and it talks in the Bible about evening wolves. And so I thought that was rather interesting. It's just a different vowel pointing uh, on Oreb than Arif. So Arif means evening. And and it and it's not like they had you know, you know, the vowel pointing is just what they put above the ein. That's that first letter, um, which is really a actually is sort of a guttural sound, um, which we don't really use in English. But uh, putting the dot above it gives it this O sound rather than these triangular dots under that gives it an E sound. <clears throat> so um, that's just the technical aspect of the word. But the idea of this raven, um, we first get it mentioned in the story of the flood and of course the story of the flood already has symbols that we've looked at one is the two periods of 150 days it gives us a chiasm with with a 300 day structure but there's also um so we're going to look at that here so there's also in this uh story of noah there is these 40 days and so we talked a little bit about that, these 40 days and these 40 years. So there's a whole bunch of symbolism involved there. And then there's these 22 days. So 21 cardinally, 22, um, you know, if we did it as uh, uh, um, you know, ordinarily, it would be the 22nd day that the dove is sent out. So that's inclusive count would be 22 days. And I also looked at there was these, these periods of 150 days that people imagined because they, they just thought there's a 30-day month. And so if you went from the 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month, that that's going to be 150 days. But it actually wouldn't, even if there were 30-day months, because the way these days are being counted, um, well, they're being counted different ways. But you know, that would be 151 days if we did an inclusive count. Um, but also there are two periods of 150 days, not one. 
And so, so this idea with the dashed lines is what most people have imagined, but there wouldn't be that number of days. And, and one of the things too, is that um, this year in which the flood occurs, there is a 13th month that needs to be added. So, and, it, and it's not really clear to people because we're going from here the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. But when we, when we actually look at the structure, this fits into the 385 day year. That's the longest year you can have on a lunar solar calendar. And um, I'm not gonna go into all the technical details, but one of the things that we see is that there's this first day of the first month to the day that the door of the ark closes. It's gonna be 40 days. And then of course you have the 40 days that it rains and then the 40 days after they see the tops of the mountains to the raven being sent out. Now, um, well, Stephen was thinking about this and what he did is he, he sent me this diagram on WhatsApp. And he's looking at these periods of seven days with the raven, the dove sent out and returns, the dove sent out returns with an olive leaf, the dove sent out does not return, and put them as a mirror uh, with the first, second, third angel's messages plus the angel of Revelation 18. So the one thing that he ties together is the raven that sent is an unclean bird, and in the angel of Revelation 18, it talks about these unclean birds, Right, so you can see this connection, but there's no apparent connection between the dove being sent out and returns to the third angel's message arrives, at least that we can see in the autumn of 1844, or returns with an olive leaf connecting to the spring of 1844, and the dove sent out does not return with the first angel's message of 1798. So thoughts on this, Stephen? Of, of this diagram, anything else I'm missing out? I mean, I know we got this seven times and you got this disappointment lined up here as well. Yes, um, so there is no record of a, a disappointment when this year does return, but you can sort yeah. of see that he's sending it out, he's hoping to be able to find land and but it's coming back again, so it means it's not ready, so there's a, like a delay. And um, you can maybe tie that sort of delay to the the delay, in a sense, with the arrival of the third angel's message and the disappointment there. Mm -hmm. But I, I only really thought of it this morning, so yeah. I haven't really had much time to, uh, to make other connections. Yeah. Now, of course, this morning was further away uh, for you than it is for us. But, um, yeah, so you haven't, you just kind of thought of it today, and you drew up this diagram. Thanks for doing that. Because uh, it does give us some, some ideas, right? Now, when we look at uh, this drawing then again, um, we can see this in this in basically just zoomed into that 22 days there right and then but we have prior to that 22 days so you're going to say that this is the first second uh third angel's message but you're going to do it in reverse right right so you're going to do this and then you're going to do it as a mirror yes but, now, what about that 40 days then? Because that's kind of where we were ending yesterday. We we're looking at these 40 days and what these symbolize. Um, so could we, is that 40 days then, are we going to place it after October 22, 1844 and do this um, in reverse, so to speak? Could we take Could we take the year of the flood and reverse the entire year? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, well, my, my thought is there, you maybe could do that in a sense that, that symbolically. Yeah. That 40 days, 40 days is a symbol of the wilderness. And um, 
you have the wilderness of the 1260. Yeah. The first angel. But that's a time of persecution. Um, mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 18, I think, verse 6, talks about double under her, double for her sins. So we know there's going to be another time of persecution. And that uh, we associate that then with the empowerment of the uh, third angel's message. So you can maybe sort of see symbolically there, 40 days, like a wilderness, then beginning when uh, that uh, Revelation 18 angel comes down. Okay. Now, um, so, so there's different ways that we could, we could look at this. We could look at it on the bigger line, but I think we need to look at it on the smaller line, so to speak. That is the line that we have, um, because when we look at the Raven and we look at Revelation 18, I mean, that's really the Sunday law on the bigger line, right? But on our line, it's 9-11. But we've also attached it to 11-9. And um, so could we take could we take this 40 days as representing the period of time? It could even be from our time of the end. I don't know what the best are from 9-11 to represent the period up to when the tops of the mountains are seen and keep going back this way. Do you understand? People understand what I'm doing here. So we know that we don't have to look at things from left to right. We can go from right to left. And, and we, we have this representing uh, our history in some way. So let's say, let's say the first day of the first month represents 9-11 here. And this raven sent out represents 11-9, right? So you got the raven sent out, this is going to be 11-9. So that's 2019, November 9th. And then we have these 40 days, and this brings us to the history of the first day of the 10th month. We have two different things that represent the first day of the 10th month. We have a December 25th, 2022, right? Because that is the first day of the 10th month. And then we have the end of Colin's prediction, uh, January 11th to 12th. And then we have this 220 days. So this 220 days goes back to um, the beginning of the flood, right? So that's the 40 days. So it's the beginning of this 40 days. And then there's the seven days, which represents um, that period. The door of the ark is going to close on the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar, the 10th day of the second month on in Noah's 600th year. Um, and then there's going to be the seven days previous to that where uh, the animals, uh, it's seven days that the animals come into the ark, right? And then, of course, from the day that the door of the ark closed, it was 40 days before, but now you have 40 days going to the first day of the first month. And if we did this backwards, this would then be, so I'm, I'm not saying that this is the right thing to do. I'm just saying, if we did it this way, this would be April, April 5th, 2030, being the first day of the first month. So, um, so what we could do is we could do it that way. I'm not sure that it makes sense or anything. Uh, I'm just saying we could, and we'd have to make sense out of it. Any, any thoughts on that? Because, you know, what we were doing before, so before we go back and, and answer that, you know, we've been going this direction, right? So the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains are seen. Then we have this period to the first day of the first month. That's 
April 5th, 2030. So. And uh, what would be the 27th day of the second month? Well, we don't know. So I don't know what that would be, what that symbolizes yet. So, so there's, so there's part of, you know, the puzzle. I mean, we don't, we don't know. Now, as far as being um, on the, the biblical calendar, that would be the 27th day of the seventh month, I believe. Um, so, yeah, it would be. which is the symbol of July 27th. So I, I think it, so if we did it that way, so if we were doing it in reverse, this would be um, a symbol of July 27th would be what? Now remember, it's, it's the 27th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. The 27th, day of the second month in Noah's 601st year. Um, but we're taking 727 to rep represent July 27th. So it's not literally July 27th, but as a symbol. Um, and then we would be taking this first day of the first month to be 9-11. Or, you know, that would be normally how we would look at it. We could even go just to Millerite history and say it's the end of Noah's predictions. But you know that that's the problem with this is it it becomes uh, you know we're, we're connecting something in Millerite history with something in our history. So a symbol in the end of the second world and the first day of the first month being the first world or third world. And then this connects to our history. So this whole history is this repeat of history. However, we would look at that. So you could have 9-11 you know, here as well. So this is just symbolizing that history of the woes. But then what would the 40 days actually mean? And this first day of the 10th month would be 2023. And that's going to reach into that history. So whether that's that's viable or not, I don't know. But those are things to think about, right? I don't know if we can we can sort this all out here today. But we need to keep this in mind when we're studying uh, Gideon's uh, lines, right? Because we already know that we're connected to this history. Right? And, and what we've done here is we've taken this 777 structure, the arrival of the third angel. And now we've looked at this arrival of the fourth angel. And so we were discussing this idea of a failed uh, line in the first generation that is this, this kind of you know, fractalization to the extreme in that um, this is already, in a sense, a fractal, right? But we're in this, in this fractal, this would actually represent a, this whole line. That is, if we're going to look at what January 11th, 2023 represents, it, it would have to be a line in and of itself which in a sense is what this line is. Um, so we would have to zoom into this though, and we would see the same history in this message. But then we would have to say that, that this, so if this was Millerite history, right? This is the arrival of the third angel, October 22nd, 1844. This would be 1863. And then this would be the Sunday law history. 
right? So the April 5th, 2030 would represent the Sunday law history. And, and we're not saying that, you know, the Sunday law is going to happen on April 5th, 2030. It's just that we have all of these connections that we've looked at previously in judges, and we're going to see them as we continue to go through the other lines, Tola and JR, uh, Jephthah, right? All, all those things, especially when we get to Samson. Samson is going to be a very uh, provocative as far as giving us these insights into uh, our history presently, what's coming, and uh, and how to understand Colin and Odilio's studies in the context of this movement, and, and also our studies. So there's, there's a lot of ideas here that we need to be able to pull together. And, you know, for me, the main thing is I have to get a paper together that, or my at least my study notes for presentations this summer. So in July, so it's um, it's getting closer and closer every day. We you know today's March first, so we got you know, March, April, May, June, so four months plus you know part of July to get together these notes. To me, that's a short period of time for the amount of work that I have to do in preparing those notes. And, um, and in our study here to, to solve some of these puzzles, I mean, maybe we won't get them all completely understood until we all come together. Um, but this, this involves understanding Odilio's studies, what, what they mean, understanding Colin studies, what they mean, and all this study in the book of Judges, both the chronology that Stephen has worked out and um, how that relates to to the book of Judges being the history of this movement and, and what that's going to mean to this movement moving forward. So it's it's a lot of things to sort out and, and I wish I had all of the answers to this, but I don't. All, all we have is we've seen a lot of these pieces. So we know Noah is connected to Gideon. Now, in in the the judges, like this in this judges lines, Gideon is the third. That is, it's the empowerment of of the first message. In the big giant line that we had, that's on slide number four hundred nine, I think. Yeah. So on this this big line, we, the flood is the formalization of the first message. And, and so that means, you know, the Gideon is, is part of this literal Israel, right? So we have literal Israel, we have the history of literal Israel, and then Gideon is, is not even a zoom into one of those waymarks because the period of the judges isn't one of the waymarks in literal Israel. It's, it's sort of a wilderness experience or really that period in between, uh, the time that they're in the wilderness and they enter into the land of Canaan um, until uh, the kingdom of, of the United Kingdom is set up, United, United Israel. So, so it's, you know, trying to understand exactly how these fit into the lines, because that's what this whole study is about, is understanding these lines. We have to have a way to conceptualize this, to present it to others, that it's, it's clear and simple. Right. So this cosmic line has the story of the flood in it. And and the story of Gideon parallels that. But it parallels it as the empowerment of, at least in the lines that we're doing in the line of the judges, as the empowerment of the first angel. But we know that all waymarks typify every other waymark because every waymark is a reform line. So it's not like only, um, you know, that the second angel's message has to always be the same way, Mark, that you're going to get your symbolism from. You can get it from any way, Mark. You know, the creation of heaven and earth. I mean, that's 
the first reform line, but that typifies all reform lines. Even this reform line, the cosmic reform line, comes from the creation of the world. You know, the seven days of creation are giving us these seven way marks. So it's a lot to get our heads around. <laughs> Any thoughts how, we, how we're going to proceed at this point? Any, anybody with ideas? No, inspiration, anything. Okay, so this was about Orb and Z, right? This is Judges 7.25. They took the two princes of the Midianites, Orb and Z, and they slew Orb and Z upon the rock Orb, and Z they slew at the wine press of Z, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Orb and Z to Gideon on the other side, Jordan. So this is going to be the men of Ephraim. Um, they took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Right? So they're going to, the messengers were sent out to them and were saying that these uh, children of Ephraim are, or these men of Ephraim, who are they in our symbols? What have we decided? The men of Ephraim are who? What, what are they? I mean, because they are a message. Not just people, but people are always connected to a message. So these are people that rejected time setting. That's how we, we looked at it. They, were, they didn't accept July 18. But they're invited. So after July 18, they're invited. And we're saying that Orb and Zeb represent specific messages related to um, the studies of Colin and Odilio. So these are pursued, and, and these messages are killed, right? But of course, there's something in these messages that needs to be understood. So this is not about people being hurt or anything like that. And they brought the heads of Orb and Zeb. So what would the heads of Orb and Zeb be? And remember head or heads, Rosh in, or Rashim in, if it's plural, in Hebrew. Um, the, he the Hebrew number, the Strong's number, is 7218. It has all the numbers of July 18, 2020 in it. Um, so it relates to that. And they're going to, you know, these men of Ephraim. So there's a message that somehow understands this, this, this message right so it's it's something that's not the message of gideon but it's related to it so is there anything that we can draw from that as far as what it means in the context presently remember we have naphtali asher and manasseh 
They're pursuing after the Midianites. That is, we take this as the studies that we're doing presently. So this call to the men of Mount Ephraim, the men of Ephraim, that come from Mount Ephraim, to pursue, and they're going to capture these two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. Does that mean there is some people studying that we don't know about that are going to be able to to help us in the understanding of what, what it is, what's happening now within this movement. Or are we getting our symbols all wrong? I thought for some time that there are those unknown and unseen that are that will come come to help us. I believe will be both human and and angels. And I know that the head is the seat of the mind, right? And the mind is where where we link up with with God. So that has something to do with this. Okay. But I was wondering what what, what the rock and the wine press could mean. I know the rock could be Christ, but. And the wine the press, wine press is, that. is, is that's already suffered. Uh, yeah, and this would also just be doctrine. I mean, this is where doctrine is being right pressed out, right? Yeah. Um, so this has to do yeah. with something that's solidly founded upon Christ. Um, and then what did you say the wine press meant? Well, it's it's where we're studying because wine represents doctrine. So wine press is where uh truth right true doctrine is is being um expressed right so the wine is being pressed the grapes are pressed and you get another question yeah have we reached the other side of the jordan and that's well that's another question too right so so we don't know what this where this is yet i still think that this is future like you know it's something that it's it's after july 18th and and this pursuing has been going on that is an invitation has been made throughout all mount ephraim that has happened and the men of ephraim these ones that gather themselves together They've taken the waters of Beth Bara, right? So Beth Bara is just the house of Bara. Oops, what did I do there? Put, uh, Bara. Um, so the house of the Ford, right? So Bara is a Ford. Um, and so that's a place where you cross the Jordan, right? And, and they're going to take these two princes of the Midianites, capture them, right? And they're going to slay them, right? Kill them. Oreb upon the rock, Oreb, and Zeb, they're going to kill at the wine press of Zeb. And they and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So I don't think we're on the other side, Jordan, yet. I don't think that that part has happened. That is, in our lines, we put this as future. And now we had put it when we dealt with Judges 7, 23 to 25. We took that and we marked that as January 11th to 12, 2023. So that's what we did with those three verses dealing with um, this pursuit. But that would be the start of it. That is, um, there's something about the January 11th, the end of Colin's prediction, that, that brings us to a new history. I don't think it's the, the crossing of the Jordan. I think that's future. 
but it does bring us to this history because I think this is the time we're in. It's just not completed. But but that's my opinion, right? Based on what we've studied, whether that's a correct interpretation or not, we'll we'll have to you know continue studying to see if that's how we're going to sort this out. But we've tried to be consistent in our understanding of these lines and these histories and taking, you know, Miller's rules, comparing all these different symbols and these different lines together. Um, the best explanation I have for Orb and Zeb is that it represents those different messages. And that is the Trump prediction, right? And in some ways, when we look at our lines, so I'm going to get, go here. So when we look at this Jeroboam and Gideon, these two different lines, we, we've said that this is internal and external, but we say that they primarily, one relates to the July 18th study, and that would be um, uh, this, this top line. Right. So this is where we're going to have the December 6th and December 25th, 2020. Um, this is going to relate to July 18th primarily because of the symbols that are there in this line. And the Gideon line is going to re represent the Trump prediction. So this one is July 18th. This one's going to be more about Trump. One is, of course, we have the January 6th siege of Washington in this this line now both of them are connected so they're intertwined you can't you can't really separate july 18 from the trump prediction even though in a sense they had different origins so um the trump prediction really came from a study of daniel chapter 11 right that i mean that's where it really started daniel 11 verse 1 to 4 and and that was, uh, for Jeff, it was an affirmation of the understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. That is, once he understood that the seven kings of Persia paralleled um, the, the last kings of the United States, states so to speak, that, that, that there was this parallel between the, like, the first kings of Persia, Right, so you have the kingdom of Persia rising up with uh, Darius the Mede and then Cyrus, etc., and that we could parallel this to our history. Uh, this is what the Trump prediction was about. Now, Colin has has expanded that, right? Um, he's brought in some elements that that tie this cl more closely together, and his study is quite important in that that respect that there's a lot of light in Colin's study that this movement could receive if we were studying together. But instead, we're studying independently to some degree. I try to study what the other people are doing so that I can um, bring it all together. But it'd be much better if we were studying all together in person whether that's on Zoom or physically together, because then we could, um, well, the main thing is not so much physically being together just to discuss ideas, but because there's conflicts that exist, why we're not studying together, and those conflicts need to be removed. Because God can't, can't speak to us if we're in conflict with our brethren in the way that he could if we were united. <clears throat> now, Adilio's study, which is, is more primarily about July 18th, um, because he's going to take the July 18th symbolism as his primary symbolism in examining the chronology of the mandates and the chronology of the pandemic, that... Um, that also needs to be understood. Now, Odilio, Odilio also had some studies dealing with Nero, which were extremely important and relate to July 18th as well. 
and to the whole issue of chronology, which I think is what July 18th is primarily about. So if we look at the origins of July 18th, it comes from a study of chronology specifically, where the Trump prediction doesn't. Right? It's not, it's not primarily a chrono chronological uh, prediction. Now, of course, the chronology becomes a part of it later on. But initially, it was if simply uh, Jeff's way of studying. He doesn't, he doesn't really use chronology uh, to produce a prediction like we did with July 18th. Um, so if we look at Gideon, because maybe we could set aside Gideon for a while. I mean, we've, we haven't, because um, when we did this, I think this was fairly a good idea. Six, seven, and eight each have their own line because this is a zoom into the November 9th date primarily. This is a zoom into the July 18th date uh, right here. And this is a zoom into the December 25th date. Doesn't mean that those dates are the middle, though here they happen to be somewhat in the middle. Um, and we've dealt with Penuel and Sukkoth, um, and maybe we could look at that, just finish off chapter eight, and then move on in, in, the, in these lines, in the study of Judges. Oh, excuse me. I knew I was going to sneeze, but... Okay, so any thoughts on that? Should we look, start looking at Judges 8 in more detail and finish off Gideon? Any thoughts on that? And, and Angel had made a comment there about wine press being Gethsemane. Um, so the wine press can be this experience of, um, which I think is important. This is the death to self, the surrender. That's obviously the message of righteousness by faith is a huge, huge, huge part of this message and an understanding of the lines. Um, so the Zeba and Zalmuna. So we, we've gone through this. Uh, we know that the, Eph the men of Ephraim are going to complain that they weren't invited, but they were. And Gideon is going to pacify them with his words. And then um, we, we dealt with this, and Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, he and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing them. So here we have this passing over Jordan. So with the 300 men. And so we have this crossing of the Jordan, in which we say that this represents, the Jordan represents baptism, and we can use that on our lines as a waymark. Now, when we originally did the lines of Judges chapter 8, we had actually gone back to um, Judges 7, 19, beginning with this call, and then Judges 8, 1 to 3 was December 26, 2020. And then, so I'll go back here again. But we didn't have Judges 8, 4 in there. It is, it's, it's not particularly a way mark. And then we talked about, we have Judges 8-6, 770, or 70, 77 days after Judges 8-8. Eight, eight. This is Penuel and Sukkoth. And the question is, why, why did we flip them? Why didn't we put Sukkoth first and then Penuel next? But this had to do with the different groups, the Canadian and the American groups. So 
just in our history, the conflict that occurred with the American group that we're putting from October 2 to 9th. And then, um, and then uh, the conflict with the Canadian group on December 25th. So that was the point there, why they're switched. We're taking that those are the different um, groups. So you have the American group and the Canadian group. And then you have the 49 days from December 25th to Adelio's study. So you're going to have Adelio presenting on February 12th, uh, his study of the chronology of the mandates. And we have the 126 days uh, from the beginning of that to the end of that, right? So, so we don't have Judges 8-4 in there. But probably Judges 8-4 should occur in this line. That is, if we were going to have this crossing of the Jordan with the 300 men pursuing, what would that be in our history? Wouldn't we take, um, <clears throat> so if we look at Judges 8.4, um, switch back here. And Gideon came to Jordan, passed over, he and the 300 men that were with him, faint and yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Sukkoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thine army? So what's happening here? What's the, what is the parallel to our history? Uh, there is no support. Okay, so there's no support for what? For uh, Gideon's pursuit of Orb and Zeb. Or of Zeb and Zamuna, you mean? All oh, right, okay, yes. Yeah, so, so there's this pursuit of Zeba and Zamuna, right? And, and there is no support for that. So we, we've looked at it happening within our message. Zeba means sacrifice. Zalmuna means shade has been denied. Right? And, and so we, we have these, these verses, eight, verse uh, four to six, verses four to six. I mean, we could probably, uh, you know, add the other verses, but... We're going to have the, you know, verse seven, we could, so we could do eight, verse four to seven, really. And, and I think that we would have to put that all as the December 25th. So we'll do that. So I go back here. We would have to put that all as the December 25th, 2021 waymark. Now, if we think about the no support, uh, what happened on December 25th, prior to that, was um, a request from the Canadian group. Could we put this, could we study together on that day? And um, because we wanted to do something special for December 25th, 2021, uh, we wanted to include some of the so studies on, on December 24th that would be international, a study that was in, in, going to be translated into Spanish live. And we also did one in Vietnam. Um, 
which I, which I can't remember. And then the order of that, I think the Vietnam was Saturday night and the Spanish one Sabbath morning. And, um, but this request to work together was denied. So this would be this request from the men of Sukkoth. Or to the men of Sukkoth, right? So that's going to be the Canadian group. So we make this request to pursue Ziba and Zalmuna. So Ziba and Zalmuna must be some message that we're pursuing. Right? Something that we're studying, which, you know, shade shall be denied and sacrifice, the, the meanings of those words. So that, to me, would fit with that history. But there is also this crossing of the Jordan. So is this crossing of the Jordan just the end of the 777 structure? Is it just that date? Are we crossing the Jordan there on December 25th, 2021? Now, does December 25th represent baptism? Can we bring the symbol of the crossing of the Jordan, the Jordan representing baptism and December 25th? Yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry, Angela first. I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> it's so hard on Zoom. Um, yeah, because that that was when you were baptized, and that was when when Clovis was baptized. Yeah, so Clovis and mine baptism, not not in the same year though. Obviously, yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Steve, uh, you had some thoughts on this as well. Okay, you're a little bit distorted. You sound like you're underwater. I'm saying that um, I can see like a, like a connection there. With the Clovis thing? A tenuous connection. Okay. Do you think that's tenuous? Well, there is, um, you sort of see that the rebirth of the sun as well has been connected to uh, December 25th. Okay, right. So, so, so we can see a counterfeit, right? Oh, so, and that's how we already saw this as the Sunday law. So that's the other part we need to think about here. So if we're saying that this is the crossing of the Jordan is, is a type of the Sunday law because of its connection to uh, December 25th. Um, and we can think of even of the flood as a Sunday law. Right? The overflowing which often is the Jordan as the symbol of the overflowing. I think it means it means a tipping point too. It's a test because if you turn to Joshua 24, 15, well, I guess from even to 14, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right. And we already connect this to, to Ezra chapter 10. Right. Because they're going to be. Um, there's this call. Right. To come to Jerusalem within three days. So we know that's going to be the 20th day of the ninth month. And December 25th, 2021 is the 20th day of the ninth month on the biblical calendar. And 
and they're going to divorce the strange wives, which is, of course, a symbol of the separation of serving these false gods, right? Amen. Right. So in Ezra 10, 9, it says, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth day or the ninth month of the, on the 20th day of the month. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. So it's, it's pouring, right? And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now, therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. So this is the same as you're talking about in Joshua 25, verse 14 and 15, right? Yeah, I see it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, so it's the same symbol. It's the same idea. And this is really the request... This is what this is what we're supposed to be doing in this movement. So it's 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 a symbol of the Sunday law, but it's it's a symbol of a choice. Are we going to continue with these ideas that that really come from Protestantism, or are we going to follow Miller's rules? Are we going to pursue? Are we going to have even support in pursuing? Um, you know, Ziba and Zalmuna, right? So Ziba, Ziba and Zalmuna much, must be messages. So, we, so, so we're going to have to understand that a little bit better, um, what, what that means. But to some degree, I mean, I look at Ziba and Zalmuna as as these messages of, of Colin and Odilio as well, right? So, so they're related, right, to Orb and Z. They're, they're basically a different symbol for the same thing. That's how I've understood it. So we're gonna have here the men of Sukkoth and the men of Penuel, both not giving support for the pursuing of the understanding of Colin's message that's going to be given on December 25th. And then with the men of Penuel, it's going to be Adelio's study 126 days later. That's going to be this, this other, other aspect of the message. And this is all in response to understanding these lines and understanding the sig significance of the 777 structure. So, Remember, when we pass through prophetic history, the fulfillment of prophecy, it's only then that we can understand it. There's no way that we could have understood um, this history of these lines that even until we pass through this history, these lines wouldn't exist without us passing through this history. You know, they, they didn't exist. November 9th, 2019 didn't exist until, in a sense, we created it, right, in God's providence. And it was created by a false message that is the message of Parminder and Tess that gave us that date in the first place for their purposes. But God intervened, and on October 13th, 2019, all of the study that, that Parminder had ignored, that he wasn't interested in, now witness to this date that he had, and he and Tess had created, and created a whole structure that, you know, we can now see in the story of the judges. Now, to some people, that might be self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, we created a date. November 9th, and then, but it was witnessed to by studies that, that had no relationship to time setting. This was just an analysis of the prophecies and the chronology of the Bible. So we had this 391.5 that came from 
understanding the 391 and a half years of the kings of Judah. And connected to the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, the 390 years and the 40 years. And now, when, when um, Tess gives us this November 9th, 2019 date, and 10 days later, it's going to be a wit witness to on another date that she had given us. That is, she had given us noon on October 13th in her study of Fatima, right? So that was part of her studies. It's actually really the first part of her studies that she presented in 2018. So she's going to give us the October 13th date. And she's going to give us the November 9th date, 2019. And then we're gonna, it's going to be witnessed that they're 391 and a half days apart from noon, October 13th, to midnight commencing November 9th. And then we're going to have the fact that, you know, her hero, uh, AOC, is born in uh, 1989 on October 13th. And then in 1990, 391 and a half days later, Tess is going to be born. Right? So you have these amazing coincidences, coincidences and structures that start to unfold. But this is, in a sense, created because of a false prediction. Right? So the prediction that Tess made for November 9th, 2019 is false. We can agree with that, right? It's a false and failed prediction, but it becomes an essential part of the structure of our lives. And so July 18th, 2020 is going to come from that. And December 25th, 2021 is going to come from that. And so we know that Deborah and Barack in the line above of the judges represents that history of the error of, of Parminder and Tess and the messages that come and defeat that. Okay, so Angela has a thought there in the chat. So she says, factions within the movement preferred by some part of partisanship, which God condemns in John, is that John 17 and 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 to 13. Whether, whether the 111 could, that is January 11th, as a symbol of the separation we have and the unity we need. Okay, can you expand on that a little bit more, Angela? It's just some thoughts that I have. I know for sure that, that the word of God does, is not in favor of, this, of, of the status that we have right now in the movement. But I'm, I'm also thinking like 111, okay, because I mean, it says, it says in, in, this, in these verses, in this series of verses here, for it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, which could mean, you know, the house of the movement, right? That there are contentions among you. So I thought, well, that's one of the, one of the verses included in this passage. So then I thought, well, one, 111. Meaning, meaning the the uh, January eleventh. Does it? Could it be referring to this too? I don't know. It's just a thought. Yeah. Well, I think it's a valid thought. I mean, the first thing we know is that the contentions that exist within the movement, uh, God is trying to resolve those, and He's resolving it as we study His Word and we we get this personal conviction of what is wrong with us. And, and then we can act correctly, because if we entered into our study with a self-justifying attitude, you know, trying to prove other people wrong and prove ourselves right about some issue or other, we would not be on the side of God. God would not be giving us light. He wouldn't be able to unfold to us these lines. Right? And, and this is a big mistake that people make. 
whatever it is you're studying, it has to be done in the spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is not going to bless us when we're, we're seeking to prove ourselves correct. We always have to be seeking to be corrected when we study God's word. And, and so often we see within Adventism, people who have a spirit of, of well, it's a satanic spirit. So they're, they're approaching the study of God's word to prove something, to set up an argument and say that I am right, you are wrong. And, and we can never come to a knowledge of the truth in that way. That's how offshoots are created. That's how heresies exist. That's how people go into fanaticism and error. And yet, you know, and that to me is the most important part of Miller's rules. Now, which rule is that in Miller's rules that I'm talking about? Which one of Miller's rules did I just describe? That would be probably rule number five. Scripture must be its own expositor, since it is a rule of itself, if I depend on a teacher to expound it to me, and he should guess at its meaning, or desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed, so that would be the part where I'm talking about. People believe that they have to support something to, you know, a belief system, or to be thought wise, right? So that's another thing that people do. It's a type of self-justification. Then his guessing, desire, creed, or wisdom is my rule, not the Bible. So, so that to me is uh, an important part of understanding God's word is the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals the understanding and it has to be consistent with the Holy Spirit. Now, the other one rule um, that would apply as well is rule 14. The most important rule of all is you must have faith. It must be a faith that requires a sacrifice. Ziba means sacrifice. Is the pursuit of Ziba and Zamuna related to, at least in part, um, the fact that there is a sacrifice and that shelter is denied, that is, we don't have a shelter from man, right? We don't have this support. Shelter is denied. And there's a sacrifice that be, needs to be made in the pursuit of truth. So the pursuit of Ziba and Zalmuna would be the pursuit of truth in regard to these messages that we might call Oreb and Ziba. That is, there's a truth in those messages but it can't be found in self-justification, uh, argumentative spirit or attitude, wanting to be proved right. Because if our movement entered into not just factions, because, because we are sort of factions, but if we started the battleground, isn't, isn't this what has to be avoided at all costs? It easily could have been done. People could have, you know, I could have started, you know, fighting against what Odilio was saying or fighting against what Colin was saying in some sort of, um, you know, they're wrong, you know, here's why sort of way. Um, but I, I understood that God was showing them something. That a person doesn't have to be all correct to know that God is leading them, right? Because none of us are all correct.
Yeah, so Angela says, shelters denied withheld as in Psalm 91, when these cells um, persist, I think she wrote there. Um, so when we talk about Psalm 91, go there. I know I wrote this as a scripture song, which I lost the recording of and don't remember how to sing anymore. But <clears throat> he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Um, so this is all about trusting in God for shelter. So God isn't going to deny us shelter. But man will. And if we look to man for shelter, if we look to man for support, um, then we're also going to go into error. This is quite a good song. You know, and it has in that that verse that Satan quotes. <clears throat> For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now, Satan quotes this to Christ, but what does he leave out? He says they shall keep he shall give his angels charge over thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So he leaves to keep thee in all thy ways. So we have to make sure that we're not just partially quoting scripture and ignoring other parts of scripture in our study. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go back to Judges chapter 8. So we have this Zeba and Zalmunna. They're pursuing. And the princes of Salkoth and Penuel, the men of Penuel, they're going to uh, not support what Gideon is doing. So he's going to go beyond the Jordan, right? He's going to go on the east side of the Jordan, pursuing them. They're in Karkor, Zeb and Zamuna, and all their hosts. Now, Zeb and Zamuna are, are um, kings of Midian, right? As it says, Zeb and Zamuna, kings of Midian, Melech. Okay. Now, Orb and Zeb were princes, Midianite princes. Uh, but these are kings. Now, again, I say that these represent messages that are being pursued. But, but they're, they're kings of Midian. So how do we reconcile that these kings of Midian represent messages of God to this movement? How do we, how do we understand that? Okay, let's, let's read this here, because um, we've done it before. Um, just going to get rid of the <clears throat> Hebrew numbers there. Now, Zeba and Zamuna were in Karkor, and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east, for there fell on 120,000 men that drew the sword. So we, we need to look at these numbers again. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbaha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. And then Zeba and Zalmunna fled, and he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and discomfited all the host. And Gideon the son of Joash returned from battle before the sun was up, and caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth, and inquired of him. And he described unto him the princes of Sukkoth 
and the elders thereof, even three score and 17 men. So how many men is that? Three score and 17. Okay, so, well, it's not gonna be 77. Oh yeah, it is gonna be seven. Yeah, 77, okay, that's right. So you have 77 men. So is that a significant symbol in the context of our minds? Yes, right? So you have 77 men, three score and 17, that's 60 plus 17, which is 77, okay? And we have some other numbers earlier, 15,000 men and 120,000 men. So we, we haven't addressed exactly, we don't have, we, we've looked at it before, but we don't have a, a definitive answer to what that means. But the 77 men are important. And he came unto the men of Sukkoth and said, Behold, Ziba and Zalmunna, with whom ye did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city, and the thorns of the wilderness, and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. Okay, so he's going to go to the men of Sukkoth with Ziba and Zalmunna. And he's going to go to these men of Sukkoth, right? He's going to tell them, look, I've captured them, right? And, and he's going to punish them. Now, what exactly is this punishment? Any thoughts on this? So he's going to whip them, right? So he's going to thresh them. Uh, he threshed them, it says in the margin. So what does this symbolize? Drawing them by God's word where they went wrong or making it very, very clear to them where they've erred. Okay. So, so we have these symbols of thorns of the wilderness and briars. Well, that's hard experiences for sure. Now, a thorn comes from the sense of pricking. Wilderness, of course, um, we already understand. Briars is just a thorn, perhaps a burn, burning brightly, it means. And, and he taught the men, yada. Um, so that, that has a lot of different meanings. Um, so it usually means instruction of some sort. Right? So it's just like the English word. Uh, taught would mean. Um, but you know, we use it, I'm going to teach you a lesson, right? So it's kind of used in that sense here. Um, so, so why does he do this here with the men of Sukkoth? Because we know that Penuel is going to be a little bit worse. We're not just going to get whipped. But these are the princes of Sukkoth and the elders. <laughs> So there's 77 of them. But what's Hebrews 12, 5 to 6 and Revelation 3, 9? I know Revelation 3, 19. I, mean, I know what that one is. Angela, what are these referring to? It says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. These verses have really encouraged me when the Lord's been slapping me around because I realized later I really needed that. Still do. Now, and we're saying that Sukkoth represents the Canadian group. I mean, the message is from the Canadian group, but the people connected with that message, right? So there is going to be, they're going to be taught. They're going to be chastened, however we want to look at it. 
by uh, by the message of Gideon. Now, when it comes to the men of Penuel, uh, he beat down the tower of Penuel. So what would the tower of Penuel be? And slew the men of the city. So this is a much worse punishment. Now, we're saying that this represents uh, the American group. But I don't think, you know, that God's going to kill them. But um, we have this Tower of Penuel. So what would this Tower of Penuel be? Because this is a migdal, so like a watchtower. Anybody want to? Well, I can think of the strongholds that they've set up, but I don't know exactly. I, I mean, I can't see all their hearts. I just have listened to some of the comments, and that's all I can go by. And I wasn't really impressed with what I heard from some people. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still fairly new to this movement. I don't have all the knowledge that a lot of the people have. But I am. I do want to learn, and I want to be remolded. I guess. Maybe this sounds prideful, but more than some appear to be. I mean, just looking at things, things, things in a shallow way from what I've seen and heard. So now, now this work. Uh, I, I don't want these strong, like I have had strongholds that I set up in my own heart, my own life that were opposed to God. And he's been conquering them and smashing them down as I go on with, with, with these studies and my own, my own private prayer and trying to share with others. But it's a day-by-day -day choice that I make, right? It has to be every single day, choosing right. him above what I want to do, what my flesh would prefer to do. Right. Now, when we think about the tower, too, I mean, it's it's not so much about a stronghold. I mean, this is a watchtower, right, a migdal. And, and the idea here is that, there, you know, we are the watchmen, right? So we have... with Within this movement, we have, have taken the position that we're watchmen. And, and a watchman is supposed to be watching. Now, some people believe that they're watchmen, but they use it as a way of criticizing others, right? And we, we've seen this all throughout the history of Adventism. You know, people who claim to be watchmen are really just doing the work of Satan and criticizing and accusing their brethren, right? They're not, they're not being restorative. They, they see the enemy in their brethren rather than seeing uh, their work of ministry to their brethren. And so this has to be beaten down, this, this attitude or spirit. Now we can see it's it's Judges 8, 17, and in reverse, that would be 7, 1, 8, July 18. Um, so when we drew out our, our lines, um, we had put, um, did we even put that there? I don't think we even put that verse on our lines, but I think it needs to be there. Um, so, so there is symbolism here, but, but the main thing here is that this symbol of July 18th, the beating down the Tower of Penuel, and, and remember um, that Penuel, this is uh, the place where um, we see the face of God, right? So when we look at, at it in... Uh, you know, Genesis 32, 31, he passed over Penuel. We got it in Judges, and it's also Peniel. That's Genesis 32, 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen the face of God. For I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved, right? So this is going to be the story um, where Jacob wrestles, wrestles with God. So, so this Tower of Penuel, Oops. 
um, is this place, this watchtower, that is where we are to see God face to face. But this, this doesn't really happen, right? Because a man looks in a mirror and forgets what manner of man he was. So we need to come to see God face to face. But they're, they're not doing the, that work. They're just, they're just criticizing others. And now, you know, and this is not to be, I mean, we've seen how the division in this movement has arisen. We've seen it in the various meetings where conflicts arose and we did not approach, when I say we, I mean all of us, did not approach those conflicts correctly. That is, what happened with those conflicts, what was said, what was done, um, was not correct. That as brethren, we should not have been talking to each other about that in that way. And also the talk that occurred afterwards, which I call schoolyard talk that sort of um, um, this false bravado that happens after a conflict, you know, with kids in a schoolyard. Maybe, maybe girls don't understand it, but guys definitely do. <clears throat> you know, you lose a fight, but, you know, you're all talk afterwards. And that's kind of, you know, this attitude that we see predominant in Adventism and in Christianity and everywhere in the world, it's the spirit of the world. Instead of seeking to be reconciled to thy brother, we, we justify our actions and we can't do that. <clears throat> so here, the men of Penuel have to be killed. That is, that attitude has to end. And then we have dealing with Ziba and Zamuna themselves. So we're going to have to come to that tomorrow. Um, but, you know, we've gone through this before, but we really need to, to kind of nail this down on what this means within our lives. And, and there still is, you know, the problem of Ziba and Zamuna are Midianite kings. But yet this is something that we are pursuing. This is a study of a message. So Midianite kings here are representing a message from God. Right? Just as Orb and Zeb do. They represent messages given us from God. Messages that have to be studied, that have to be pursued. And so, so we're going to have to come in and study that in more detail tomorrow. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I do think that, you know, Stephen's idea there that we still have to come back to that at some point with the, the diagram we showed at the beginning. Um, and the story of Noah as it relates to Gideon. But I think we're getting things sorted out. It's just every time we sort something out, there's more we see that needs to be sorted out. So it's a little frustrating. I would just like to see it all fall into place nicely. No loose threads. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. Thank you again for each person. We pray for this movement. We know that um, each one of us has faults, has sins that need to be confessed, has attitudes uh, that have at times been harsh towards our brethren. And it's easy to see the faults of others, but much more difficult to recognize those faults within ourselves. So we ask for forgiveness. And we pray that through your spirit, you can work upon the hearts of those around us, hearts of the people in the movement, and that you can bring us together in Christian love to study your word and to see the wonderful things that are in it. Thank you for hearing our prayer. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.